Whoever says in that last 15 seconds, you can't reflect, you can't consciously decide to kill someone, they're flat out wrong. In that 15 seconds, I made 10 decisions. I'm going to take the trash out when I get home. I'm going to make dinner. You have plenty of time to reflect in three minutes to kill someone. Every word that comes out of this defendant's mouth is a lie. He's a compulsive liar who lied, lied, lied 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, 50 times, over 100 times in that time frame to the police, to his parents. You can't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. And why do people lie? We all have life experience. We all know why people lie, and it's to cover up the truth. And the flat truth is, on that date in April, on that day, this defendant decided he was done with Randy and he was going to kill her. That's why he lied. And Mr. Wood would want you to believe that the state is restricted to that three minute window to establish all the evidence to show you his premeditation. Well, that's wrong. That's not the law. The judge never told you, restrict yourself to that three minutes. Your job is to look at all the evidence. Your job is to look at his mindset starting 36 hours before where he decided he was going to kill his wife. Maybe he didn't do it that night, but guess what was festering underneath his skin? Guess what was mad and hostile and angry? He hated her. She cheated on him. She masturbated without him. He was so angry that he threatened multiple times to kill her. And Mr. Wood would have you believe in arguments with regular people that that's what they do. Do regular people threaten to kill their spouse, their boyfriend and girlfriend multiple times? Do they say you have to walk down the street strapped? You better make sure you have a gun on you? Do they tell you you're not going to wake up in the morning? I submit to you, life experience shows you that's not true. Do regular people pick up a gun that is loaded and they throw it at their wife and tell them to shoot themselves? Is that what regular people do in arguments? I don't think so, ladies and gentlemen. And what you get to weigh in this case, Mr. Wood tried to say there's no evidence. So let's go through what the evidence is and how you get to get to the point of the insurmountable evidence in this case. So you get to rely on circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence goes toward the circumstances of the crime, right? We have to look at all those circumstances. Because if you go by what the defense argues, if there's not a video or an eyewitness, we never know what happens and we can't convict people. We couldn't convict them of murder. If you kill someone in private, according to the defense's argument, you can't convict them unless you have a video, an eyewitness, or a confession. Well, I'm here to submit to you that's patently false. You get to look at all the circumstances of the crime to see whether or not they indicate to you that he committed the crime. Let's start out. We have the premeditation. He premeditated 36 hours before to kill his wife. And then let's talk about the circumstances of the crime. He came in here. I submit to you, you need to take his testimony, crumble it up, and throw it in the trash because that's what it's worth. He has no credibility. First of all, he told the police over and over again that it was her fault. It was accidental or it was suicide, but it was her, right? And, and what did he tell the police the whole time? I'm being very honest with you. Thank you, Judge. I'm an honest person. You know who tells you you're they're an honest person? Someone who lies. That's, what I, that's the only person who tells you they're an honest person. Let's go some more. I do not have nothing that I haven't told you. Well, who else tells you that? People who lie. Because we know that he had a whole different story to tell. Is there any chance at all that something different happened that you have not told us? No, because that's what happened. I got to I got to know these guys are you guys. I mean, you guys are investigators, not. This guy sat in an interview with the police. I submit to you showed no emotion or remorse at all about what happened to his wife. 
He got on the stand and testified. You had an opportunity to observe him. Let's talk about his in-court testimony. Let's talk about what he didn't do. What did he not do one time? When you saw him on the stand up here, where did he look the entire time? He looked at his attorney sitting right over there talking to him. He didn't look you guys in the eyes once. He didn't look at all you and tell you what happened. And I submit to you because you would have saw right through it. And he knew exactly that. Think about that. When you talk to people, what's the biggest factor you need to tell if they're being honest with you and truthful with you? You need to look them in the face, see how they react to your questions, see how you inter interact with each other. Think about that. Think about one time, not once. The only time he looks at you is when y'all were walking in and he's standing up looking this way. Otherwise, this way the whole time. Think about that. That's something for you to weigh. And I submit to you, his story is just the most unbelievable amount of... I just can't even give a word to it. First of all, let's talk about it. What he determined over the last two and a half years, he determined that his story he told to the police would never play in front of a jury. It would never work. So what does he do? He comes up with a new story and he tries to formulate it around the facts. Well, guess what? He told Dr. Buffington, excuse me, Mr. Buffington, somebody who is there to help him, someone who's hired by his defense team, a different story than he testified to you in court. How does that happen? How do you tell a different story to the person hired to help you and then a different story when you're in court to the jury? And I submit to you, the reason why his stories don't match up is because they're lies. And we know he lies, and we know we can't believe the word he says. And his story about self-defense, does that make any, any sense in this case? Or is it the most outrageous explanation of what happened. So he wants you to believe that his wife and the defense made goes to great lengths to, uh, to, to demean Dr. Goldberg that he doesn't have this personalized attention with individuals. But what did Dr. Goldberg tell you? He testifies and reviews thousands of reports a year and he reviews video of people at the scene when they're on meth. He's actually called to court to, he's there to say whether or not legally that person is impaired. And what did he tell you? He told you he did the most basic thing in this case. He looked at the video of the morning. He looked at the video of the morning and he said, I compared that with the toxicology results and his expert opinion, there was nothing wrong with Brandy. She was not under the influence. She was not hallucinating. She was not out of control, nothing. And what's even better, ladies and gentlemen, y'all have eyes. You watch those videos. Is there anything in her actions, in her words, that indicates someone who's hallucinating? Did you see her point to the Green Martian? Did you see her do backflips? Did you see her jump on the ground to avoid the tiger running at her? No, because it's not true. And the defense hires Mr. Buffington. And what does Mr. Buffington do First of all, he gets in the stand, and he doesn't tell you what the defendant told him. Under direct examination, which is where you bring out the information, what did he leave out? He never mentioned it. Ask yourself, why did he not mention it? And I submit to you, it's not until Miss Dutton pulls it out of him. Right? And what else didn't he do? He didn't look at the most basic piece of evidence in the case. The videos right before she died. Uh, oh, I didn't. I looked at one she was walking. The other ones, I just don't know. Come on. Is that somebody who's really a credible expert you can rely on? This person who claims that they, they don't remember making statements in a deposition, right? Don't remember it. And then even when this Dutton brought it out, I still don't remember it. And then when we brought out that he got $187,000 for defense work and $8,000 for the prosecution, which is 96% to 4%, he claims he just doesn't know. And then when asked, when was the last time you testified for the state? Uh, sometime, I can't tell you the name. Think about that. Think about how much credibility he really has. And what does he really tell you? And what is the defense really trying to do in this case? They're trying to take a big mural, and they're saying all meth people have these actions, right? They're trying to apply it to Brandy. Because what they know is that the evidence shows she wasn't showing those facts. Right? This, this crazy story that she says he's made of plastic? Come on. And then let's talk about it. So 
walk through this. We got Mr. Johansson coming out of the bathroom, right? Because she said boo. Uh, well, this is the story this time. Let's just play the story. So he comes out of the bathroom, and there's a box over there. She's pointing a gun at him from over there. So he has enough time to saunter over to the box while she's pointing a gun at him, like threatening his life, like dear life. He has enough time to walk over, dig into a box, pull out the gun, and hop on over to the side of the bed and meet her over there and try and grab the gun or she turned around and then accidentally he shoots her in the chest as they're struggling. Does that really make any bit of sense? Think about it. And then uh, it goes further. He shoots her in the chest, and then I think he said she put the gun behind her back, she cocked it, or she put it here and cocked it. I don't know, but his story was she puts the gun behind her back, it's cocked, right? She's cocking it, and then somehow she turns it around and she hits him, but he's stepping six feet back and he shoots her. Does, does any of the story make sense? And then Mr. Wood tried to say, look at that Beretta. Look at the Beretta. It looks like it was shot. Well, well, think about what Ms. Draga told you yesterday. And that's why I spent that long time going through it with her. That Beretta was never shot. That bullet that was stuck, it was in there because it was a misfeed, which means it wasn't shot off. And when it loaded up, that's where it got misfed. So there was no shot off. None. Think about it. And then some of his story then is just so incredulous to believe that his wife sets off these accidental shootings in their old house to the ceiling or the couch. I, I don't even know. But then she has a gun that has rubber bullets, but she doesn't like that gun. So he gives her the Beretta, which is full of regular bullets. The woman who's a dangerous person shooting inside the house multiple times, he gives her with no rubber bullets. And then his explanation is, well, that's a gun I keep in the car for protection, and I needed to bring inside because the neighbor. But let's separate that. So he's got a gun next to the bed here. He's got that can of gun, but then he has to bring a third gun into the bedroom to protect against the neighbor? What, are they going to war? Come on, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't make any sense, his stories. Let's talk a little bit about him. Consciousness of guilt. That's the key word I want y'all to, 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 we're going to pay attention to. And what that means is that person is guilty based on their actions subsequent to what happened. And let's see what he does. Who do you think accidentally shot her? Not me. Um, herself. I figured she was trying to help what she to me. She was maybe move them or trying to move them. Who does he blame? He blames her. Not me. Not me. She blamed herself. He blamed her that she was moving him. Hmm. Consciousness of guilt. Let's talk about more consciousness of guilt. As Ms. Dutton said before, when he shot her and it was accidental, he didn't provide one bit of aid to her. He didn't go up to her. He didn't put her hand to her chest. He didn't try and get a towel and stop the bleeding. And what was his explanation yesterday? I think this was what it was. Um, I, I, I couldn't find the bullet hole. What? She's wearing a shirt. What would any reasonable person do in that situation? Pull the shirt off and look for the hole where you just shot the person? Think about it. Does his explanation make any sense? Really, the reason is he didn't give her aid. You get to use for consciousness of guilt. The reason is he didn't want her to march through those doors, get on that stand, and tell you what he did. That's exactly why he didn't give her aid. That's something you get to consider. All these factors are consciousness of guilt you get to utilize when you convict him, ladies and gentlemen. Then what does he do? Consciousness of guilt. Your wife is bleeding to death on the floor. Bleeding to death. And your first thought is to move marijuana? And then his explanation was just the gosh darn best. So whenever I go into the living room, it's my habit to move the marijuana. Seriously, your wife's just shot and dying on the floor, and it's your habit. I have a slide to show you in a second. It's pretty interesting. That's fine. We'll, we'll come to that in a second. But why don't you watch the slide? And Mr. Wood showed you half of it, but then he stopped when he was carrying the marijuana out. But you're going to see the one where he went out to get his pants. 
when he went to the pants to the living room, was he carrying marijuana away? No, but every time it's a habit. When I go to the living room, I just pick up marijuana. I'll show you. As far as anything, as far as getting justice for your wife. Better gun control schools. Better gun control schools. Readily available. What in the world does that have to do with this? <laughs> no, because if she knew better gun control, you know, it, it probably would not have happened. So you're blaming her again? If she knew better gun control, this wouldn't have happened again. No, this wouldn't have happened if he didn't shoot her in cold blood that day. That's when it wouldn't have happened. That's the honest I could To his dad. I was honest as I could be with dad. Let's, let's try and get, oh, here's with his dad again. This is 20 days after, and, and the defense tries to make a, a big deal about it, his statement with the police and his statement with the family that he was in such um, horrible, um, torturous situations in the police department, and he was just under such immense pressure, and that's why he couldn't tell the truth. And then you heard him when he got on the stand. I, I didn't have representation. And then Ms. Dutton challenged him on it, and she said, you need a lawyer to tell the truth? And, and he just continued to hem and wouldn't answer the question. Th think about that. This is a guy who, talking to his parents on the jail call after, Talking to his parents on the jail call after, he still refuses to tell them what it is. Where, where's this immense pressure from the police at this time? Where's all this stuff? It's not existent, and he continues to per uh, perpetrate the lie. All I can, all I can say to you is be honest. I All I know is they have evidence. I didn't do this. Like I said, if you did this, Tell them. They do it now. I don't believe this. Why not? I wasn't there. I believe what you tell them. I mean, not in my mind. I believe it. Not in my mind, by the way. I didn't do this then. And then consciousness of guilt. And then let's talk about this is the next phone call. Here. Oh, what happened? I don't know, Pete. But, you know, he's a little boy. So, so this guy, in jail, after the crime, who am I going to blame? Who am I going to put this on? Conscious of guilt. And who does he choose? He chooses a six-year-old boy who is in a towel. That's the person who probably did it. We'll get back to the self-defense in a minute. But I do want to take you to a few things here. This is important, the way that these guns are laid. This defendant staged that scene. He set it up to try and perpetrate his lie to the police. Look at how those guns are set up. And then here's the best part. He claims that this panic gun, which is what murdered Brittany, wasn't in the holster. The holster that is ah, one and a half feet away, and why is that holster important? It circles back to premeditation. So think about it. In order to get a gun out of a holster, you have to think about a step or take a step to get it out of the holster. That provides you the time to reflect on what you're doing. So Keith Johansson, although he wants you to believe, they just moved there a month ago. And miraculously, the, the holster that goes to the gun that killed Brittany, and is it with one and a half feet of her, that he just normally stores it under the bed. Which it's not even under the bed, it's like at the edge of it. Just miraculously, that's where it's stored. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, Keith Johansson went to that holster, he pulled the gun out as he was reflecting, as he was premeditating, and he made that decision to kill his wife. That is a factor for premeditation for you to weigh on. Here's the distance like I was trying to show before. The defendant claims he comes out of the bathroom, and this is where his gun is, and his wife is over there. And just somehow he's able to miraculously get to that gun, point it at her while she's doing all this. Mind you, if she wanted to kill him, why didn't she just walk in the bathroom and gun him down and shoot him 15 times? If she said he's made of plastic and she wanted to kill him, why would she call him over? Hey, boo, boo, why would she do that? Does that really make any sense? 
Of course it doesn't, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about right here. We can see that's where the bullet struck after it went through Britain. And what's interesting about this, and, and we haven't really drawn it out a lot, is it kind of shows sort of the alignment of what's going on. So, as Ms. Dutton said before, the first shot is a contact shot. As Dr. Bulick told you, that's directly against the chest. That is right there. You have no space. It's right on. Okay? And as she told you, that is, that is a factor of premeditation. You have to be cold and clear to put a gun up to someone's chest and pull the trigger. So he pulls the trigger, and, 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 and I know the defense didn't want to really acknowledge this, but she's tiny. She's a tiny woman, and, and the power from that gun to a belief that she would just tick back, according to his story, and then she would continue to advance forward with the gun, that doesn't really make sense. And what, what I submit to you, what makes more sense is, he shoots her, and as she's falling back, or once she hits this, the bullet goes through her, right? Remember what Dr. Bulick said? It goes through and it has a, a slight downward angle and it comes out her back. It's almost consistent with her falling down and taking a shot right to the chest. It's consistent with him premeditating and killing her. Use those, those are factors you get to weigh. Those are factors you get to use when you make your decision. We talked about the jammed gun. Show a copy Does that sound like someone just making an idle threat? Or does that sound like someone just having a minor argument? He knew exactly where he was going to wind up after. This is the moment in time he was premeditating to kill her. See, what, what Mr. Johansson underestimated is the fact that we'd be able to get these videos. Yeah, because he couldn't log into his account or he claimed he couldn't, but he just miscalculated that the police would be able to pull these. And of course they show his exact mindset. Here he is, Mr. Johansson, on the phone with 911. I was in the shower and I heard some gunshots. And I think that my wife accidentally shot shot. Okay. Carrying away his marijuana, right? And then, like I said before, this is his, it's a habit of what I do. This is him going to get his uh, pants earlier. Huh. Is he picking up any marijuana? I don't think so. Just goes to show you his story does not make sense. And when he testified yesterday to you, he was lying, ladies. Our job is to show you the evidence. In this case, the evidence is overwhelming. Premeditation, the ability to think or reflect before you do it. And I submit to you, on April 5th, this defendant made that conscious decision and he carried it through on April 7th. Now let's talk about what he did at the end of April 5th that's another sign of premeditation. What did he do? He moved the camera out of the bedroom. Why would you do that? Why would you move a camera out of the bedroom that you had in there? And his story was, oh, I didn't think we were going to have sex anymore. And then Ms. Dutton was like, well, you thought you were going to be a And he had no answer. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, the reason he moved that camera, thinking in his mind, planning ahead, he did not want a recording of him killing his wife. That's exactly why he moved it. And let's talk about the rest of his premeditation. Ain't waking up. Sounds like a threat to kill someone Sounds like premeditation, right? Hmm, what does that sound like again? Probably what? Premeditation. 
Yeah. I'm gonna get my homies to make sure you both die. I've been waiting here long enough. Kill you. What's that once again? That's right, premeditation. I'm gonna kill you. gentlemen. Once again, premeditation. Premeditation on this guy's part. Of course, he wants you to believe that this is how regular people argue, and he just let all of this stuff go. That thing was worth <coughs> fucking life, bitch. What's that? Once again, premeditation. Premeditation again. I'd rather kill you. I'll kill you both. What's that again? Premeditation. Can you push a person to either beat or kill you because you're a whore? Once again, premeditation. How many signs of premeditation were there that night? How many times did he do it? Over and over again, ladies and gentlemen. Unlike what Mr. Rubin wants you to believe, that we can't rely on premeditation from 36 hours earlier, that is not the law. You get to rely on all the facts that came to evidence. You get to weigh those. You get to decide whether or not there was premeditation. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, there is an insurmountable amount of premeditation. I submit to you that his story of self-defense it, it, it makes the only way you believe that it was self-defense is if you believe him. That's the only way. And I submit to you, he's about as credible as as this chair over here, ladies and gentlemen. You've had an opportunity. Did he give inconsistent statements previously? Does he have a stake in the case? Come on, all, almost all the factors the judge will ask you to weigh for witnesses' credibility, they apply to this defendant. So the reality is, there is no self-defense in this case. So did the state prove premeditated murder? And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, you heard all the evidence. You heard the testimony. You heard his consciousness of guilt throughout the entire process. And this man sitting right here, he is responsible for Brandy's death. He is responsible for cold blood and killing her. And we ask you to go back and return a verdict, a verdict of justice, like the defense said, a verdict of justice for her and find him guilty. Thank you.